So uh, yeah, hi everyone. Good uh, turn. Good turn up. Thank you for coming to uh, this seminar. Um, unusually on a Wednesday, but this is because it's co-organized by CAS, the Canberra Archaeological Society, and R. Thanks for uh, being here. Um, I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the uh, Nambri and Nanawal people, traditional custodians of the land on which I am uh, and where we gather virtually today. And pay my respects to the elders, past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. So today we have the honor of hosting Rob Williams for a presentation uh, on the archaeology of Futuna, South Vanuatu. Uh, Rob graduated from a Masters of Archaeological Science program of the ANU in 2016. Some of his results uh, indicating that banana cultivation in the Torres Strait around 2000 years BP were published in Nature, Ecology and Evolution last year. In 2017, Rob was awarded the ANU's Young Indigenous Alumni and he has previously held roles at the IATIS and the ANU. Rob is currently writing his PhD on in the uh, School of Culture, History and Language in CAP uh, at the ANU and the presentation today here uh, will be about uh, the project and uh, Rob will summarize uh, the main findings. Um, recently, Rob founded an Aboriginal owned and run heritage consulting firm, Morumbiji Archaeology and Heritage, uh, through which uh, he aims to uh, help build and nurture the next generation of First Nations archaeologists, which I thought was worth mentioning here. I think we can all agree it's a fantastic initiative. Looking forward to hear uh, more about it in the future, but um, for today, uh, let's get ready for the presentation. So, uh, Ram, whenever you're ready, uh, feel free to uh, start talking and share your screen. Thanks. Okay. Um, all righty. Uh, you can hear me okay? Yep. Okay, thanks, Matthew, for that introduction, uh, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, it's a nice sort of full circle because I remember sitting in these lectures and car seminars when I was an undergrad at ANU, and um, I thought maybe just one day I might give one of these. Um, so here it is. So um, I'd like to start by uh, also uh, my acknowledgements. So Yurudu Marang, which is good day in Wiradjuri, and Yuma, which is hello in uh, Nanawal probably also Wogaloo of the Canberra region. I'd like to pay my respects to the Narendera people, which is the area where I'm living at the moment, the Rangers, it's now known. Um, and it's just further down the Murrumbidgee from Canberra. So as someone who has ancestry to the Canberra region, to Wogaloo, Ngunnawal, Nambri people, uh, it's nice to still be connected to um, that country just further down the river. I put up this photo uh, from 1974 of my dad uh, waving the flag at the Aboriginal Ten Embassy um, and I just wanted to really sort of acknowledge that generation from the 70s and 80s, the activists, the ones who really sort of established Aboriginal medical centres, uh, fought for land rights, um, really laid the foundations for my generation. And also there were some of the first uh, Aboriginal people to go through universities. So they were really sort of, um, sort of opening the doors for people like myself to now have these kind of opportunities to, um, to study. Okay. Uh, a little bit about the team and the project. Um, so, uh, the lead investigators of this project, uh, my supervisors are Stuart Bedford and James Flexner, and also Frederick Valentine, uh, who, uh, yeah, sorry, I said the lead investigator, investi uh, investigators, um, and also to James Flexner, who really got me onto this, uh, invited me to be part of this project uh, way back when. Uh, he, he was a very patient supervisor and helped really sort of nurture my uh, uh, intellectual growth over the last few years. So um, I acknowledge his work. Uh, and also, I really, there's one particular individual who make projects like this possible, and that is uh, Jimmy or Takaronga Kuatonga, uh, as his real name, I guess, his actual name, but people affectionately call him Jimmy. Uh, and it's people like him who make these projects possible. Uh, Jimmy really sort of nurtured, uh, nurtured me while I was working on Ireland. Uh, he uh, held my hand, he took me around the island, he introduced me to everyone. And he also has a great deal of experience of working in cultural heritage. Uh, he worked at the Vanuatu Cultural Centre for many, many years. Uh, and then also he was trained as an archivist at the Australian Museum. So you know, he knows what we're doing. And this is really important for when we're trying to get our um, 
basically trying to get our message across about why we're there and what our interests are. Um, so without Jimmy, really, this project wasn't possible. So a lot of thanks and, and praise goes to him. Uh, just a couple more photos, and I'm sure some of you have seen this because there was a couple of media releases, and I wasn't directly involved in this, but I am, I guess, by association a little bit. Um, and that one of the great outcomes from this project was uh, the recent repatriation of ancestral remains from Fortuna. Um, and for those of you who don't know the story, uh, Richard and Mary Shuttler were the first really pioneering archaeologists in the 1960s to work in this part of southern Vanuatu, really in the Western Pacific, I think, uh, or at least in the Vanuatu archipelago. Um, they excavated a number of rock shelters across Fortuna, and part of that work was that they uh, exhumed these ancestral remains. They took them back to America, where there were going to be further studies. Uh, I'm not sure if this ever really um, eventuated. Um, but then some 30 years later, through the work of people like uh, Professor Matthew Spriggs, uh, the director of the Vanuatu Cultural Centre at the time, Ralph Regnivanu, uh, and, and others, Jimmy, as well, uh, they, these remains were repatriated back to Vanuatu, were kept at the Vanuatu Cultural Centre. And now, uh, as part of the sort of the, the rounding off to this project, and the end of this project is that these remains are then returned to the island of Fortuna. So, you know, in terms of outcomes for this project, yes, we had some great archaeological uh, and scientific uh, results, but, you know, in, in a sense, it's all sort of, in, at least in my perspective, you know, in terms of, uh, it's kind of trumped by this really uh, awesome, uh, awesome part of the project um, of returning these ancestors back to their, their home. Uh, so there's just, uh, photos of the, uh, some of the chiefs with the boxes down at the bottom, you can see, and, and an original photo from, this, from the excavation on Fortuna at Ipau in the northeast of the island back in 1964. Uh, I'll just give over this. There's not really too much to add to it. Um, it was a little bit about my methodology and really what my interests were when I was going out into the field. So my main, my main focus was looking at the human environmental interactions and looking really at the sort of the agricultural domain. So the chronological boundaries, you know, when did, when did this start to really develop on the island? Um, that was one of the primary challenges of my thesis. Um, and then it developed while I was on island, looking more at sort of uh, oral histories and uh, settlement patterns in terms of village and things like the political space, such as the Marae, um, or what is the central square of, of the village, villages on Fortuna. Um, the third, the bottom point there was, you know, it's sort of optimistic and ambitious that I'd be able to go out there and I would find, but this wasn't really sort of what I was out there to do, but I would find one site where I'd find some sort of a sequence, archaeological sequence of what was cultural replacement um, of an incoming or a migrant population. And really these kind of sites are just rare, sort of, um, I think anywhere, and particularly in the context of Polynesian outliers, uh, there isn't a lot of evidence for um, what is cultural replacement of, or, of, or direct evidence for a Polynesian migration. Um, but anyway, uh, I did still sort of uh, have a couple of results, and some of these results also really sort of point towards more of a local regional network, which was basically the Southern Vanuatu regional network um, that was uh, um, that extended through to the Loyalty Islands. Uh, mapping was the main thing that I did. So, you know, we're talking about hiking up and down steep slopes uh, and mapping as many stone uh, by walls, ropi that I can, and garden terraces that I could really get access to. Uh, but it's tough work. Um, I'll show you some more photos, obviously, of the island, but uh, most of these sites have been abandoned. Um, so they've been overtaken by dense vegetation. Um, and unless you have someone in there hacking with a machete, it makes it pretty much impossible to get access. But uh, as you'll see, we've got some really sort of some interesting results um, in, you know, in some of the complexity of these agricultural systems and of these village uh, um, locations um, is shown through some of my, some of my mapping and some of my results. Um, so just quickly, uh, Fortuna and Aniwa collectively are part of, well, uh, a group of islands known as Polynesian outliers, so-called Polynesian outliers. Uh, and these are 18 communities that are spread in a sort of northwest, north, southeast arc across Micronesia uh, and Melanesia. Uh, basically, what they share in similarities is that they are all linguistically or linguistically and culturally related enough that we know that they sort of uh, at least probably uh, originate from an ancestral population somewhere in Western Polynesia. 
Uh, and you can see down there in the bottom, West Fortuna down in southern Vanuatu, that's where I am working. I won't say too much more about them. I have a lot to get through, except we'll look, oh, sorry, a little bit about their chronology. Because it's important, it provides um, some contextual sort of framework uh, for where, where Fortuna and the Niwa, specifically Fortuna, fits into the picture. Uh, so some of the islands have what we call sort of long chronologies, uh, we're talking specifically about Polynesian outliers, uh, and they sort of mirror some of the, the larger neighbouring islands in which they're close to. Uh, these ones with sort of deeper histories that extend back to Polynesian settlement, sorry, uh, Lapida settlement, uh, extend back to about 3,000 years uh, before present. Uh, examples of these are Tikapia, Anuta, Anuta and, um, and Taumoko. Um, these islands have long settlement histories. There are other islands with sort of what I would call mid-range chronologies. And then there's uh, other Polynesian outliers with what, you know, really much shorter chronologies. Uh, the two sort of northern atolls of Micronesia, uh, both have short chronologies which date to within the last thousand years. And I guess I should point out that before the start of this project, um, that Futuna and most likely Aniwa, I guess, even though there wasn't any um, work really done there, but Futuna at least, uh, also had a short uh, archaeological record of 1,000 years, so it was, it was grouped into this uh, into this more recent um, into a shorter sh having a shorter history. Um, at around 1,000 AD, and this is where our orthodox model or understanding of Polynesian backsettlement, so-called Polynesian backsettlement, or as being called other things such as blowback, which uh, I'm not sure where that one comes from. Um, um, drift voyaging, um, but I like to use the, the phrase back settlement. Um, but at around 1,000 years is when we believe that the, there was a settlement from, uh, well, archaeological models suggest that there was a settlement of Polynesian, out, uh, Polynesian outliers uh, from east to west, from somewhere within the Polynesian homeland. Uh, linguistically, there are some uh, uh, places such as Wallace and Fortuna, which potentially is the origin point of the southern uh, Polynesian outliers, and Tuvalu is the origin point of uh, this is based on linguistic evidence of the northern outliers. But that all this happened within the last 1,000 years. And in terms of archaeological evidence for this, uh, really the best known examples are from Tikapia, um, what is the uh, Tulkamali phase, uh, and really where. Uh, Within this phase, novel artifact types turn up, such as uh, adzes made of oceanic basalt, uh, as well as trolling lures, uh, bone beads, and more recently, um, there's been some more study of obsidian from the site, and these uh, have, have been sourced to Tonga, so somewhere in the Tongan archipelago. archipelago. Uh, Polynesian outliers. Okay, uh, down to the region where I'm working where we did work of southern Vanuatu into the province of Tafea, um, which is basically an acronym of the five, uh, acronym of the, the names of the five islands of the south, uh, Tana, Anitium, Petuna, Iramango, and, and Niwa. Now the islands of south, they all, uh, the islands of the south, they all um, uh, differ uh, in terms of, they have contrasting size, uh, contrasting geology, soil, and uh, importantly, uh, access to vital resources such as water. So uh, Eramungo, Tana and Anaitim are all large mountainous islands. They're quite fertile and rich. You know, Tana has an active volcano and they're quite large relatively. Uh, they have surface area, uh, Tana has a surface area of 550 kilometer, uh, square kilometers. And just to put that into perspective, we'll compare Futuna to, um, which has a surface area of 13 square kilometers. Um, and it's, that's a bit misleading because most of Fortuna is really just uh, steep hills and uh, cliffs and terraces. Um, and really, you know, the only sort of uh, settlement uh, places or habitable areas are, are really quite small. Uh, just again, for some more context, sorry, I should have started my stopwatch, so I know I'm, I'm going over too much. Um, so the archaeology of the South, just again, yep, to provide a bit of a bit of context. So uh, as I was saying, Richard and Mary Shartler worked in Southern Vanuatu through 1963-64, um, and the primary concern of their work was to establish a chronology for the southern uh, islands of the archipelago. Uh, as I mentioned, they focused mainly on rock shelters around Fortuna, Tana. Uh, they did visit Aniwa, but supposedly didn't 
uh, undertake much of a survey because their work was impeded by bad weather. Now really, just to summarize and what to take from their work is that the, on Fortuna, all, the work, all their um, radiocarbon dating uh, basically uh, established, uh, it came back with um, that the island, all the sites that they worked at were dated within the last 1,000 years. Um, and that was pretty much it in terms of what we knew about the chronology of Fortuna for a good 50 odd years until really this project kicked off. Um, they also were gifted and excavated a number of artifacts, uh, material culture, and they, this material culture didn't really differ uh, in, any, which, in any way from uh, what is expected for um, uh, Southern Vanuatu. I'm talking about the material culture from Fortuna. So there was no signs of any sort of uh, uh, um, novel artifacts, which may suggest they had um, some sort of Polynesian connection. In terms of other islands in the south, um, so Eremungo and Anaitum are probably the most well known in terms of archaeological work. There's been substantial surveys and excavations undertaken by Stuart Bed Bedford, uh, Matthew Spriggs, uh, and this is also where the first Lapita sites were identified for southern Vanuatu. Um, so Eremungo has uh, two or three sites in the south. Uh, this word always catches me, but it's uh, Penamla and Ifo. Um, and importantly, the, the latter, Ifo, um, has a uh, pottery bearing post Lapita site. So this continues for about three, uh, for another thousand years of pottery production at this site until it was abandoned around 2000 years BP. Uh, throughout this time, uh, a regional um, variation, the pottery style uh, developed uh, and became quite distinct. So, and then the next Lapita site, which wasn't discovered until 2012 um, on the island of Nitium, again, after many decades of work, um, was actually found near the Mission House. And you can see in the top right photo, uh, Stuart there in the test unit, uh, excavating right next to the old Mission House on what is an old beach terrace where Lapita was eventually found. I mean, pottery was found on a night in back when Richard and Mary Shuttler were working there, but it turned out that one of the ceramic pieces that you can see num uh, labeled A um, was uh, an example. And these are historical introductions, uh, most likely from Santo Island. Uh, the pottery shirt on the right is the Lapita example with uh, a zigzag motif, which is of, uh, late, of, of the late Lapita phase. So why is this important? Well, basically it provides uh, um, the regional context of which we'll base our work from Fortuna. Uh, and it shows that pottery uh, manufacturing, local pottery manufacturing continued in the South for at least a thousand years following the initial colonization. Uh, Matthew Spriggs obviously did a, a lot of work on an item, and this has been sort of a, a reference point for my research, really looking at the agricultural history of the islands, uh, the development of agricultural, agricultural intensification, and also the timing and chronology. Uh, and a lot of his work, uh, particularly uh, some work they did with some of the poll pollen analyses uh, done with uh, also with Jeff Hope, uh, established that there was massive deforestation, uh, things like shore, uh, valley infilling, shoreline progradation, uh, which started around 3,000 years to 2,800 years BP. Um, and then uh, it seems that this agricultural uh, domain really started to, um, uh, to speed up around 2,000 years. Uh, the most recent sort of work, more recent work that, been, that has been conducted in the South has been done by uh, Dr. James Flexner, uh, mainly on the mission history of Southern Vanuatu. Uh, and then also a preliminary excavation at Sino. So this is on the uh, northeast point of Fortuna Island. Um, and it's important that, well, this was the first excavation really to happen on this island for a good 50 years. Um, so that's important. Uh, but also it gave us an indication of what, what we should maybe, or what we can expect in terms of undertaking archaeology on this island. So Stuart and the team from the Vanuatu Cultural Centre uh, excavated two test units just behind this, this beach spit that you can see. Um, and one of them, I believe, was dug to about 2.8 metres below surface. So very, very deep. And at the very base, they returned a date of uh, about 1,100 years, 1,000 years BP. So again, falling within that range that uh, the Shuttles had originally established. Um, but it also showed that, that you know, trying to find these old sites on the islands, particularly at this location, which is uh, one of the best locations, perhaps where you'd expect to find the Peter. Uh, it's, a, it's a beach with uh, you know, a nice canoe landing. It's, you know, um, but 
it's accessible, which is one of the main things. Uh, but uh, it also is that it demonstrated that um, this part of the island is probably subsiding. So any really old sites have probably long gone or, or been washed out, uh, washed out to sea long ago. All right, so a little bit about the island. Uh, so it's about 13 square kilometres in size. Uh, it, you know, it really sort of juts out from the ocean when you see it on the horizon from sea level to around 666 metres above sea level. Um, at its widest point, it's about five kilometres um, uh, east to west. Uh, and also you can pretty much walk around the island in, in the morning at a brisk pace. So you set out in the morning, you'd be back before, before midday. Uh, it's not an easy walk. Uh, you know, the paths are notorious. Uh, they're dangerous. There's some you know, really dodgy ladders you've got to climb down over cliffs. And anyone who's worked on the island uh, knows this, uh, particularly from the team. Um, and that was uh, always a, an exciting trip to some of, some of these sites um, located around the island. Uh, the, the top of the island is, so it's basically uh, uplifted limestone reefs, ancient reefs, overlying uh, a dormant volcano. The top of the island is like a limestone cast system. So in many ways it acts like a big sponge. So the top of the island has what you know, is, is pretty much always wet. Uh, you know, it's often raining at the top and, and acting like a big sponge, it sort of absorbs this water, the precipitation. And then this water, I believe, is sort of, uh, is, is funneled down and, and trickles out at, at some of these limestone escarpment uh, walls, um, really providing the only water sources for um, uh, local food to these. And there's only a handful, handful of these um, freshwater springs around the island. Um, so that sort of takes me to that point about fresh water and resources being sort of uh, not evenly, uh, so, so highly variable in terms of their, their, their place around the island. Um, access to water is one thing, access to good soils is another thing. Um, so um, there are a number of soils on the island, um, some are more fertile than others, obviously. Uh, and this little uh, photo at the top just shows you a cut on the village uh, where a house is and a very sort of narrow layer of what is sort of organic soil. Of course, this has already been cleared, so it's not really a good example, but a button then sitting on top of what is called Kerry Nanga, Kerry Nanga, Kerry Nanga, Kerry Nangi uh, in, in local vernacular. Um, and that's basically like a degrading uh, basalt, um, um, uh, yeah, like a degrading basalt mixed with clay. Uh, natural resources, uh, this is a narrow fringing reef, uh, the main sort of activities that people uh, engage in are uh, fishing, uh, you know, sort of one of the main economic activities, uh, yeah, things like basket weaving. Um, and, but really sort of in terms of economy, agriculture is still uh, probably the most uh, important uh, activity that people still uh, practice on Fortuna. So Fortuna has the archetypal wet and dry division that is typical of high islands of the Pacific. Um, and this really determines precipitation patterns um, and also the makeup of island biota and in particular vegetation. So uh, in response, people created, uh, people applied interview strategies that in Fortuna took the form of stone built pie or by and water fed and dry land agricultural systems. Um, so there's significant uh, landscape modification through the building of this stone terracing uh, and also through other activities such as mulching and tilling the soil uh, to improve. But really, you know, the development of these buyers is what was captured and, and really by creating what was a sustainable and fertile agricultural landscape. And is there anything else I wanted to say about that? Uh, not particularly. Uh, this is just some examples of some garden types. Um, you know, it, on Fortuna, people have quite literally used every uh, square inch of landscape that they can. Uh, it is uh, quite limited uh, in terms of surface area like we were talking about. But um, yeah, so this is an example of really uh, steep hillsides. So even just to get to this point, I had to kind of walk up and uh, both hands and feet, you know, crawling up the side of this hill. And when you get to these really steep um, gardens uh, at Yosoa, this particular district, um, people don't use stones uh, because obviously they're dangerous. They go tumbling down into the village, um, but it's much easier just to kind of uh, lie these, uh, these wooden um, uh, 
uh, wooden trunks down for, for gardening. Anyway, it's just a unique aspect of Futanese agriculture, which I thought was uh, useful in uh, just showing you. And the photo to the right just kind of gives you an idea of how steep this landscape can be that people are gardening on. Uh, again, a little bit more about sort of the infrastructure around the island. Um, so this is Bretu Sori, Sore, so the main path. Um, and this is just to give you that, uh, an indication of some of the size of the walls that uh, people have constructed in the past uh, and really how sort of uh, manicured um, the landscape has been, the, the cultural landscape, you know, sort of roads with guttering, uh, massive monumental walls, uh, which take you know, a huge amount of effort to build. Um, and the, the cool story about the one in the top left, I guess, and there's different um, versions of this story, but uh, Futuna, some people in Futuna told me that uh, this particular wall and this particular part of the road was actually uh, built by people from Nitium who had come over either as slave or slaves or labour. I'm not sure how true that part is, um, but anyway, it's just an interesting or unique part of that um, part of this landscape. Uh, the ethno history of the island, we'll just go over quickly. Uh, so the island was first sighted by Captain James Cook in 1974 while he was anchored at Port Resolution. And then this is really where the first uh, names of uh, the islands were, uh, the island surrounding islands were given, of Iniwa uh, or Futuna, and which was also called Aron. And um, there's not too much really to say on this, except that um, while they were there, they noticed that two languages were spoken uh, and that one of them was very similar to the language, to languages spoken in the Friendly Isles or in Western Polynesia. And of course, this suggests that people from Futuna were actually at Port Resolution during this time, um, showing that there was a, that, that, that connection, um, or that uh, maybe people people uh, uh, of Port Resolution were also um, were, could also speak uh, Futanese. Uh, and that was also indicated by one of the chiefs they met at Port Resolution, who referred to himself as Ariki, which is obviously the Polynesian chiefly name and the name for chief on Futuna. Uh, the later history of the missionaries, they arrived in 1839. Uh, Reverend John Williams was the first from the Camden uh, who sailed into, Herald, uh, into uh, what is Severaro or Herald Bay. Um, now, poor yeah, Reverend John Williams, after his first visit, actually met, you know, was martyred on Eremango, was murdered. Um, but about a year later, the Camden returned and uh, settled two Samoan teachers on the island. Uh, I think everything was going according to the, to the story uh, written by uh, Reverend uh, William Gunn, who uh, wrote the Gospel of Fortuna some time later. But uh, sadly, a uh, pandemic swept through the island and uh, the Samoan teachers were blamed um, and unfortunately murdered. Uh, Samuela and, and Apella and their families were murdered as well. And um, down in the bottom right is um, Ninga Sao telling us, actually Matthew was, was there for this story, Matthew Spriggs. Uh, Ninga Sao was telling us um, of the story of where Sam, Samuela, Samuela uh, met, his, met his fate. Anyway, it's just an interesting part of the history of the island and I thought it was worthwhile sharing. Um, and also, um, there's been, uh, yeah, anyway, we'll keep going. So what else do we know about when the missionaries arrived? They left some uh, indications of that, we, that I can sort of draw upon in terms of agriculture. Um, but also they gave some indications of uh, epidemics that went through the island, um, but also of population. So um, there's been a couple of different population estimates. Reverend Gunn, uh, Joseph Gunn, when he was there in the 1960s, gave a population estimate of, um, of around 900 people. Uh, that was across all districts of Fortuna. Um, and I think following, following him, there was another, uh, believed to be another epidemic. and um, then by the time Dr. William Gunn had arrived, and I believe there was an epidemic while he was on the island, which took the, uh, the lives of his two children as well, of dysentery, uh, wiped out a, a huge amount, of, a, a, a basically killed another um, large amount, killed a number of people, you know, hundreds of people. And his population estimates were somewhere around 300 to 400 people. Now, if we can extrapolate or compare that with what happened on the night in where there was an estimation of around 90% of the population were, were killed through pandemics. Um, well, you know, that means that the, the original population for Tuna could have been anywhere upwards as a sort of, um, anywhere upwards from 3,000 people if we go off that uh, population estimate of, um, of uh, Reverend Gunn. And that sort of makes sense. When you see, see this landscape, um, how much it has been modified, the level of investment in terms of making gardens, um, 
you know, there must have been thousands of people. I don't see how else. It's, uh, yeah, it, it is pretty extraordinary. So at the time of uh, a sort of, unfortunately, the missionaries also didn't leave us much information in terms of cultural, culture and customs. Um, you know, Joseph Copeland, Reverend Joseph Copeland basically wrote nothing about traditional society in Fortuna. Um, um, but um, William Gunn left you know, you know, quite a lot of information that we can draw upon, which is useful, uh, including sort of the original sort of dis uh, district uh, boundaries on Fortuna. Um, so there's eight districts, wedge shaped districts in Fortuna. Um, and they all served uh, as their own political uh, sort of entities. And within each of these districts, the system was separated into what, what was a dual society. So there were two moieties, and these moieties were known as locally as Kavi Meta and Mangruke. And you can see it as an image. Uh, this is from, oh, I didn't reference it, sorry, um, from um, Keller and Kuatonga um, about um, sort of the the Maruke and Kavya Meta, and uh, that they that each moiety um, had individuals that were responsible for uh, different elements of Fusunese custom, society, uh, weather, sea, um, agriculture, uh, sorcery, um, and that really this this dual society, uh, which were collectively known as the Vaka, um, were really sort of the foundation of um, uh, I guess the political system on Fortuna. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned, but then each moiety each had a sort of a head chief or a high chief. So there was two sort of head chiefs or high chiefs in each uh, district. Uh, each moiety also had their own marae. So this is important for um, archeologists because this is archeologically visible uh, in, in terms of that these are sites that we can record and if given permission that we're allowed to um, excavate, which I was, which is fantastic. Um, and really sort of, the, I guess, provide an, an um, some archaeological uh, interpretation, to, or at least an extra layer of interpretation to some of these oral histories and, and stories on uh, on the island. Um, Namruka and Kavi Meta, they also had different sort of uh, idiosyncratic um, characteristics so in terms of their behaviours. Um, so, um, and they also had different symbology, uh, and also they had different uh, sort of landscape features that were associated with them. Um, and, and like I said, certain marae, um, sacred stones. Um, but this basically divided up, uh, where am I going? We'll keep going. Uh, so the marae, they're not really used, of course, how they were in the past. Um, where there were essentially uh, men's meeting places for kava drinking. Um, so now they're used for all sorts of things, including soccer games and netball. But ceremonies are still practiced in terms of things for like, to use a uh, very Australian phrase, sorry business, when there's a death in the community. Um, this is where people congregate. Uh, this is where there's an exchange of food. Uh, and, um, or for other sort of, you know, Christian uh, religious events, uh, celebrations of Independence Day, uh, these still all happen in Marae. Uh, we still do drink carbon in Marae. So in the top left, we, uh, as part of what they, uh, what is common in Fortuna and Vanuatu, is they have a uh, sort of tombstone ceremony, uh, set, uh, ceremony about a month after the person was buried. Uh, and this is when everyone in the community comes together. And I was very, I felt very um, lucky to be part of this opportunity. We were sort of, uh, carbon was, um, and it's distributed between uh, each of the village groups. And because we were staying with the Ipau uh, family and Ipau group, uh, is that we then drank kava with, um, with, the, with Ipau. All right, so let's go into some of Fortuna's uh, early sites. Uh, so this is a site called Pun Punangatu, uh, which I excavated in 2017. Uh, it's on the northwest corner of the island. Uh, it's a really quite a beautiful place in terms of sort of access to sea, uh, you know, access to uh, to the coastline. Um, you know, it has a canoe pass. Uh, it's very calm when really the, the the windward side of the island is always you know obviously choppy and windy. Severaro is very calm, uh, and it really sort of lends to it being a, a good location for conducting um, an archaeological investigation at what was an extremely uh, large rock shelter, which they really might pretty much call a village. Uh, it was a village in the past. And it was also a marae in the past. So it was the only marae on the island where people could consume root crops. And it was also a place where uh, uh, boys were initiated. Um, 
so just we'll go over this pretty quickly uh but yeah so conducted a small excavation in 2018 another excavation was conducted there by the Van Cultural um, Center crew um but yeah my work there um established uh a quite an old well really it you know, gave us our first sort of insight into a deeper uh, human settlement into Fortuna and pushed back uh, the known chronology for the island. Uh, so at the very bottom, uh, radiocarbon dating, we I got a date of 2,500 years BP. Uh, at around midway, midpoint, uh, within sort of feature two, I um, excavated, started excavating what would appear to be um, ceramic wasters, which are um, uh, a result of the pottery production process. Um, but then also what looked like a small pottery shirt, uh, which until the Met to the other pottery that was potentially that was excavated on the other side of the island by Stuart and, and crew, uh, I guess was the first one to come out of Fortuna, which was exciting. Um, and it isn't much of a shirt, sorry, it's a tiny little fragment of uh, urban wear. But anyway, uh, Yadawai Philip, who uh, is a lot more experienced in ceramics, uh, pointed it out to me, and he, you know, he's pretty sure it is, it is pottery. Um, and then by a thousand years, we had another feature. So, really, this entire deposit is just sort of like a you know, a mixture of sort of um, uh, quite uh, uh, distinct occupation levels uh, with stone, um, ovens, uh, quite dense charcoal, and then sort of abandonment where you're getting uh, infilling, uh, looks like coming from downslope, uh, really sort of calcareous, gravel, sterile soils, uh, and then again, you get another occupation level. So just that, uh, yeah, that sort of uh, interchange between cultural layers and sterile, uh, not much going on. Really, there's not much else to add to it. Um, there was nothing really sort of super exciting that came out of the uh, out of the hole, um, uh, except for maybe that small piece of uh, pottery in the top left. Um, and uh, but really, it's the date, you know. So it sort of um, really pushes back our main history of uh, and settlement of the tuna. And importantly, of course, it ties it in with the regional uh, story, and that there was a level of uh, continuity between uh, pottery. pottery Pottery traditions of Eremungo, uh, and now we know of Tana, of Niatium, uh, that this also extended to Fortuna. So, you know, that's a great, it's a great outcome, it's a great result. Uh, by a thousand years, um, I was getting a lot more sort of shell working. So these are some shell blanks made of um, trochus. Uh, we get shell beads that are turning up, and the shell beads are what become what these conus shell beads were also recorded epigraphically from flake stone abraders, the usual sort of refuse um, that you find in, uh, but mainly just shell and a lot of fish remains. So uh, to skip over to the other side of the island, which is another uh, old early site that was excavated uh, by Stuart and crew uh, is Punangafatu. Um, so this is at the district of Iraro. Um, and it's also uh, another little beach hamlet, quite like, uh, Punangatu, sorry, the names are very similar. So Punangatu was the uh, first one I just talked about. Punanga basically just means cave wall, stone wall, uh, and then Fatu stone, so cave stone. Uh, Punangatu just means cave cave wall. Um, but again, yeah, nice little beach, beautiful little beach, uh, suitable for landing canoe, um, and it's uh, relatively sheltered. Uh, the village is called Teoni, uh, and this is just a picture of it. It's, uh, it's a gorgeous beach. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's a little terraced village. Only one family lives there now, Lindsay, who is uh, very helpful for our work. Um, you can just see it a bit more. These terraces going up, and then at the very rear of this, oops, my uh, at the very rear of this village is uh, the rock shelter, which was excavated by Stuart and crew. Uh, here's a map, a map that was actually done by James Flexner, but I went through and digitised it. But it just shows you the location um, with the beach out to the uh, to the east and in the screen, sorry, it's getting in the way. Um, minimise it, there we go. I won't look at myself, that's better. Um, out to the east, the Pacific Ocean, uh, where I was taking those photos from, and then you can see nestled up at the, at the rear of the village uh, is uh, Punangatu. Uh, so Stuart and the crew conducted a number of excavations of these. I believe they didn't finish them, and uh, we were going to return in 2018 to excavate these, but I don't think, um, in the end, we weren't given permission to continue um, excavation at the site. Nonetheless, there were some great results that came from this location as well. Um, not only were ceramics 
uh, including wasters and multiple sort of plain wear shirts uh, that came throughout the deposit, but also some other unique little uh, artifacts, um, which really show the richness of the archaeological record from the tuna, uh, this deep sea fish hook made probably out of turbo, I think, um, and these uh, cool adzes. Uh, Toki Fasua is the triacna adz, and then Toki is the stone, the stone adz uh, in uh, local Futanese. Uh, interestingly, um, and I'm sure there's people who are obviously listening who are a lot more experienced with this with me, so excuse my ignorance, but the, um, these, these ads forms basically don't change for at least uh, 2,000 years. They, they stay relatively, uh, pretty much the same as they are uh, found in this, in this early excavation, um, you know, dating to at least over 1,500 years for this, um, for this Tridacna ads, as I'll show you some photos later in the slide. Um, uh, I, I ended up getting... Um, I was able I was able to photograph a number of um, uh, shell and stone artifacts, and um, more or less they yeah they, they sort of stay the same, which is unique. We'll talk about that a bit more. All right, but anyways, uh, as you can see, dates from this through in the lower, lower deposits came back at about twenty three hundred years. All right, so we're just going to jump ahead a thousand years. Well, not really. We're just going to move um, further to uh, some of the work that I did on our early village sites, um, and. Sorry, I need to catch up. Uh, and the first one we're going to look at, and if anyone has heard James speak about Fortuna previously, uh, you'll see that um, he uh, mentioned this, this location where we worked. Um, so I, I basically just give you a bit of a brief or an overview of uh, what, um, uh, what it was like. Uh, I mean, the, sorry, I just lost track of my notes there. I got them jumbled. Um, so the site is called Tatonga, which I think is a unique name as well. Uh, definitely pointing to the east, to Polynesian connections. Uh, and it's a unique site in that it also has oral histories associated with Tavaka, the first canoe um, to arrive to the island. There was other canoes which weren't successful in their uta, which is the other word for their cargo, basically tipped over. And this uta that tipped over is the location of Perumu, which is in the south right photo, you can see that arrow go. So this was the unsuccessful Tavaka canoe that didn't make, didn't successfully land at Tehuna Beach, which is the beach I just showed you. Uh, it's also associated with uh, uh, conflict and war. The lookout at the top is a place where someone would stand and if uh, canoes were on the horizon, they would uh, light a torch and, and scream out to the people further down the hill to warn them that uh, there were people on the way. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of stories as well of wealth and richness. I'm not going to go over all of them. A lot of them, some of them associated with Majijiki, the culture figure, the deity that was known throughout all of Western Polynesia and the Pacific. Western, uh, and the Western Pacific. Um, so yeah, it, it, you know, it's it's yeah, it's phenomenal in that sort of sense as well, having that that extra oral uh, history and, and layer um, to the archaeological and to the sites that we're about to go over. So to Tonga, this is basically an, um, uh, an, an, uh, a layout of the site. Uh, I, underto I undertook two excavations at this site, only small. Um, and looking back, I wish I'd focused a bit more work. On this on this location, this is somewhere where I really could have um, sort of focused much of my PhD research on, because uh, it is that great. But anyway, I was sort of drawn by the all the other interesting places around the island. Um, wow. Okay, time. Sorry. Um, but anyway, so we'll skip through. Um, but anyway, the unique thing about this, uh, the, the initial central location uh, that where I excavated returned to radio, radio carbon dated about 500 years BP. Uh, and, and then the excavation at the rear of the site at a ropi or by um, uh, also returned to data about 1,000 years BP. So again, falling within this 1,000, uh, within the, the last 1,000 years. So a consistent picture. Uh, in terms of some of the, the, uh, the amazing sort of infrastructure, uh, investment in stone structures uh, in this location. We have um, trenched walkways, uh, uh, elevated walkways, and these are massive. Some of them, as you'll see in this next photo, are two meters high, and this is called a road, this is called a, walk a walkway. And as what I see that these are, these are really important. Uh, these were seen as sort of funneling people up uh, through very specific avenues. There's only two entrances to Tatonga, to this location, and you have to go up these paths. So whether this was a form of kind of, um, Okay, well, I'm not sure, but it at least shows that um, taboo and property rights were, were very uh, were, were important, and that you had to stick to these walkways, and that to um, step off them was seen as, a, as, as an aggression or um, um, that you weren't meant to do that, basically. Um, whether it's fortification, I'm not quite sure. That was my initial sort of um, 
um, thinking when I was first there. Um, just the, what the layout with these um, large uh, wall structures around uh, um, around the the outer circle of the village, and then with cliff drop off, drop off, drop offs. So really, the only entrance point into these into these villages through these elevated walkways, which is quite unique, and it looks like it all probably at least dates within the last one thousand years. I mean, more in depth and, and further survey would sort of help sort of refine this. Again, Jimmy, just showing you some of the size of the stone walls. Uh, it's just some terminology for stone walls uh, that natural sort of features are incorporated into them, such as uh, topoka or toka. Sorry, um, these are just some examples. This is just the excavation points. Um, we've got to skip over that. Okay, the next site I want to speak about was a lunga in Yatu, uh, Yatafu, which is located on the um, back at Sivara, Sivararo, uh, and. The great thing about this place is that it was, uh, it has such uh, oral, um, okay, the, the wealth of oral history and traditions is um, really uh, phenomenal. Uh, and that everywhere that has a story, every stone, every tree. Uh, and some of these st stories are really important in that they are sort of uh, part of the sort of the national identity of Futuna or Futunese. Uh, and also that they're also related and tied directly with uh, ongoing connections with outside the island. So further afield, further on the horizon, uh, many of these stories that are uh, associated with uh, visitors from Tonga uh, um, associated with places around, around this particular place so, uh, and the site of Sina Fine Ariki. Um, about this place, uh, so the maps, here's a better map. Um, I was shared a lot of the story about this place um, by uh, a local elder, Bu Shavaka, um, who spent a lot of, I spent a lot of time with him and um, I mean it was, it was a great experience because he was more than happy to share as much as he could and, and he was so interested in what we were doing and he, he was down in the excavation unit digging every day with me um, so you know that, that was really cool but yeah this was really his story the story of uh, two or three families that live within this vicinity are they the direct descendants of this of this particular site and this location and sort of hold authority over what's happening there and i think that's why i was given permission to dig because where i'm digging is actually a um uh, uh fire marae or basically the, the chiefly house of this marae so you know the, the social significance of this place is huge and to be given the opportunity i guess to excavate it is also huge um, it's located right next to Namruke Marae, so the, the, the political square, uh, and right near um, Kalviometa, uh, Kalviometa, which is down at the bottom, um, the, the two green sections that you can see in that map on the left. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, this is just a, a photo of Marae, of Namruke Marae. So this is called Marae Moonga, uh, so basically the Marae of, of this district. Um, belonging to the particular Moiti and Ruke. Uh, just gives you an idea of what they look like today. Uh, and then this is one of the excavation units that I uh, got to drop down into this um, chiefly house. Um, and what this really showed us is that, um, well, yeah, I guess it all sort of really dates to in the same period and had what was uh, sort of phases of uh, a lot of ground ovens, of uh, ash lenses, a lot of uh, what, what I, uh, I've interpreted these cut and fills as um, post holes. Uh, and it actually became really quite complicated and yeah, um, difficult to, to grasp because there was so much going on in this tiny little excavation uh, unit. Um, but in terms of uh, dating, uh, towards the bottom, a uh, oven feature that I dated came back at around 660 years BP. So again, frames that are this particular part, of this, uh, this the Mirai, the chiefly house, I think, within that last 600 years or within the last 1,000 years. Um, that's not, yeah, and um, supposed Polynesian back settlement. Uh, and also, interestingly, a couple of these post holes dated to uh, right within 20 years of each other at 480 and 416 years uh, calibrated BP, uh, which is, I think, suggests that there was uh, perhaps it might be the one structure that was standing there um, uh, shown, shown through these post holes. Anyway, these are just my interpretations and, you know, uh, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. Um, but yeah, this is something that I will explore a bit more as I sort of really write up this chapter on these, on, on the Marae, the, the chiefly villages, uh, and this chapter of Fatuna history. Um, 
in terms of some kind of neat artifacts that came out of them, um, I mean, uh, one of them on the top left is a trolling lure. And for those who are familiar with um, the Tukamali, or Tukamali phase, I'm not pronouncing it properly, of Tikapia, which is purportedly the phase of Polynesian backfilling, one of the artifact types that was novel and int supposedly introduced by Polynesian settlers were trolling lures. Um, so look, I'm not going to make such a um, uh, such a claim based on one trolling lure, but it is interesting nonetheless. Uh, as I was talking about how uh, Tridacna adds forms never really changed for a good 2,000 years. On the right, we have Turkey for Sua, uh, excavated within uh, bracketed within 600 to 300 years BP, and you can see that it's more or less the same as one excavated 2,000 years ago, um, with slight you know, variation, uh, probably just down to the person who made it. Um, so that, yeah, that's an interesting continuity, I think, in artifact types in this part of uh, Southern Vanuatu. Uh, the, th this is just an indication to show you how, uh, it's not that important anyway, sorry, this is in the modern house, it's not a traditional sort of Putinese house, but it shows you how the post hole is built uh, and, and stilts over um, what is a rope eye the terrace right there at that marae. Uh, this is the Kaviometa marae, um, which is just give you uh, in, another image of um, the, the neighboring marae uh, next door to the one that I excavated. Uh, taboo stone down in the top bottom left. And these are kind of littered uh, throughout the village sites. And it's interesting that they kind of left them. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't know, I was sort of thinking about this a bit. Um, you know, on a night in the taboo stones were, dug, uh, were buried, you know, that was part of the, the, the missionization and um, the evangelizing of that community is that the taboo stones were buried. But here in Fortuna, they've been left out and I, I'm not sure whether uh, that was the case, that they, they, maybe their power or their magical um, um, capacity was still, is still kind of believed in and, and, and revered um, or feared in a sense. Um, and these would have been standing up in the past, um, but now they all just kind of lay flat. Uh, and you find them around Marais. Marais. Um, so one of them actually I've had a look at, I lifted up. And um, I moved ever so slightly. And being a sour, one of the local guys was like, oh, mate, did you, um, he didn't say it like that. He said, oh, did you play with, uh, did you move that, that stone? And I said, yeah, I was having a look at it. And um, uh, anyway, straight away I knew that it had been moved ever so slightly. Thankfully, it wasn't the spirits of the island that did it. And I still survived after looking at it. So there we go. They're all around. Uh, further uphill from that site where I dug, this is an example of one of the maps that I did of one of the uh, dry lane agricultural terraces. It's a mix right now. Some of it's been used, some of it's abandoned, um, but it's, it's, it's mi mixed crop production, uh, banana, taro, uh, sugarcane. Um, but anyway, my goal was really to try and get some date to this system. Uh, down at the bottom, Jinaroa was dated to around 400 years BP, and then further uphill, um, I, I came back as modern, unfortunately, at about 130 years BP. Uh, this is the site of Ginaroa. So what I do is I excavate to the bottom of the, of the stone wall. I dig around for charcoal or shell that's found underneath. Uh, I bag it, you know, hopefully it's usable charcoal, something without nothing, you know, not with anything sort of inbuilt uh, age. Um, and really it's not a perfect science. What I'm trying to do is really just kind of give the maximum age of these features, of these structures. And uh, a neat little part of this when we finished and this is the only place that we did it is that Bull Shavaka started a fire. Uh, in the in in the uh, in the test unit before burying it back, and this is tradition that when uh, you dig holes, particularly uh, for yam, is that you uh, put nurmalanga or ash into the bottom of the hole, uh, so it enriches the soil. I guess provides a level uh, slight alkalinity to the soil. Um, so anyway, um, this was a nice little sort of uh, tradition in practice as part of the wrapping up of this excavation unit. Uh, this is a, a water taro, a water fed taro garden now growing a lot of kava as well, um, which I didn't find, I wasn't told about until pretty much the end of my survey uh, on my second field season, but that may be because the, this particular spot is currently disputed about who it belongs to, um, so perhaps it wasn't appropriate for me to work there. Uh, there's Matthew, he did make a photo uh, uh, looking at that rock garden, uh, that, again that water fed taro garden. Uh, on the right is a yeah, either the axe grinding or they grind coconuts basically uh, for watering containers. You know, keep going. Uh, on Ipau, on the uh, northeast of the island, um, <clears throat> so you can see Sino was that photo that I showed you early on uh, where they returned uh, dates of 1,000 years in 2016, Stuart and James and Frederick. Uh, but this is another place where I then conducted a lot of survey, mapping, 
uh, and also went over, uh, yeah, working at a, what was it, an ancestral village. Uh, this is just a map at the top of the hill. This top one I dug at um, what was uh, 330 metres elevation above sea level, uh, maybe 400 metres right at the base of one of these sort of uplifted cliffs, limestone cliffs. Uh, it's very tough to get to. It's all abandoned now. So no one is really gardening this high up the hill. Um, so it was neat to be able to go up there and, um, and work in this location. Uh, Tangai Rao, which is the one on the left, sorry, this is the one at um, quite high elevation at Ipau. Uh, this also returned quite an, an early date, which I wasn't really expecting, and this might not be quite the accuracy of this date, I think might be questioned, but it returned a date of 1000 BP. Again, it fits within the same um, time frame, but um, whether that dates to sort of the time that these grow ply were built, uh, at this elevation is another question. And it may actually indicate sort of early land clearing uh, at around a thousand years ago in this part of the island. Uh, continue on, Vete Manu on the right photo uh, was an old village site, had uh, sort of deep cultural deposits and that again returned a, a date of 1000 years BP. So there's some consistency with dates across the island. Alrighty, um, so I didn't really, specified to start, but those other sites that I worked at, the agricultural ones, were all dry land. And now we're moving to the southeast, the windward side of the island, which is all, uh, particularly at this location, Mahaipua, uh, it's called Matangiwai, uh, is the water-fed taro, uh, water-fed irrigation systems. Now the actual size, the, uh, just did a quick sort of map the sort of size of this particular uh, garden that I excavated, uh, I think it was about 4.8 hectares. Um, so I didn't map the entire thing. It's really sort of impossible considering the level of um, growth and vegetation growth over this part of, uh, uh, of this stretch of the garden. Uh, it's not the only water-fed garden uh, in this location. Next to it is uh, Yakanavai, um, which uh, James and I mapped, with, uh, mapped in 2018, uh, total station mapped it. Uh, we also managed to get a, a, a date for that system. Um, but anyway, continue on. So Matangivai, um, as I said, is a taro, uh, uh, is an irrigated, or it's a terrace system based on water taro. Uh, mainly water taro is the main crop. There are other crops which are sort of uh, grown uh, sort of um, within the system, uh, but that is limited primarily to uh, sugarcane and kava. Yeah, principal crop is um, is taro, and it's extremely productive. But as I was saying, like this entire area is basically uh, abandoned now. There's only a few gardens that are used, mainly just because the population on this part of the island is, most, is so small. Um, there's only two, uh, two or three households, so there's no need to to have multiple gardens running. It's just a lot of extra work when they're already really um, highly productive. Uh, in terms of sort of the infrastructure of the gardens. Uh, it's, it's hard to kind of give you an indication. Uh, I'll just jump forward to some photos. Um, it's, re it's really hard to describe or photos don't really do justice. Um, but, um, you know, we're talking about really sort of monumental, I know that word's probably overused, but you know, monumental scale investment in landscape modification to create what is a highly um, uh, uh, productive um, agricultural system. Um, and we just go back, sorry to jump back and forth. There's no real sort of, at least from what I could gauge, um, sort of structure to the system, except for having these long uh, walkways, uh, which they call roads, which basically go from the base of the agricultural system all the way to the top. They don't go completely, they intersect with each other, and then they'll keep going. So you have to kind of jump across from one to another. Um, and that these are massive, uh, they're, they're absolutely huge. Um, I mean, some of these, these roads are three, three meters high in some locations, you know, and this is based to the, to the ground level uh, of the, the terrace systems, uh, massive stone mounds. Uh, it, yeah, it, it, it really is hard to describe. Um, like I said, there doesn't seem to be any sort of uh, structure to these systems, um, except for, uh, I mean, back to the roads, they serve a purpose in that, again, there's um, taboos about stepping foot into other people's gardens. Um, and so these were the main thoroughfares of how people got to their gardens. Um, um, uh, in terms of uh, what these may provide us 
for our interpretation of uh, political economy. Um, well, I think we're quite limited actually, but I, I, you know, this is just, I guess, me sort of riffing a little bit my interpretation that um, the sort of uh, the small scale size of these gardens, there's many, many, many all packed in together um, and that they also, uh, they're all owned by um, people who are spread out across the island. And I, you know, this sort of comes, this ownership comes down to uh, moiety affiliation and also to uh, descent lines. And so when you have intermarrying from district to one district in between, uh, from one moiety to another, and um, moieties were endogamous, so you're only marrying from, say, Nemruke to Nemruke, Nemruke. But then, uh, you know, um, this would then set up um, uh, what would be um, property rights to that new district on the other side of the island. The children basically would inherit, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and so I think this is the case here at um, um, the Tangivai at Taramao, because people all around the island have rights to different gardens here. And whether this is a, sort of a phenomena of, uh, of, of um, post-Christian fraternal societies, they're sort of the questions that I'll have to ask, but I believe that these go back um, pre-colonization. Uh, pre, um, uh, in terms of sort of uh, what has been used to kind of uh, make an argument for centralized power, um, for political authority and governance on other islands, um, there doesn't seem to be that sort of uh, infrastructure in this particular garden. There's not large canals that can be blocked off and redirected by chiefly elites who are controlling certain water distribution. Um, and that doesn't really align with at least, our, with, with at least what we know about Futanese um, hierarchy as well. Uh, Futanese hierarchy is more sort of egalitarian in a sense, uh, in that um, uh, one chief described it to me while I was on the island is that uh, the chief didn't have outright power to be able to sort of demand or tell people what to do. Instead, they would lead by example. Um, so they would set the example by going and working in the garden and then the community would follow. Um, and, you know, I think really sort of the, the structure kind of just in terms of political authority sort of just um, and centralised power kind of just follows what is uh, in existence today. We have two chiefs in each district, each have equal say in what's happening in the district. Um, and um, that uh, I think is probably the case um, historically. How can we look at that archaeologically? Well, yeah, you know, that's really a challenge. Um, but there may be some little indications. So in the way that these terraces were structured, that they had to be maintained in a way that water um, distribution was even. So um, it was really important that they were, uh, when they were built, or when they were, when maintenance was happening, uh, was occurring, that the, the bottom of the gardens, uh, and this is the same situation on the night team as was described to me by Matthew, um, is that the bottom of the gardens that there had to be a, a watertight clay uh, layer underneath, and this was massaged with their feet, and then on this um, certain leaf species would be um, placed, basically creating a water seal. And, and then this would uh, fill up the, the gardens evenly, and then they would evenly pour over to the next side, and, uh, you know, to the next garden down, which means that your, uh, your neighbour, uh, your family, your relation further downhill, or perhaps what is more likely is that your garden that you also own downhill, and you know, there was probably um, ownership at the bottom and at the top of the system, uh, uh, received a, uh, uh, an equal amount of water. And I think that's a nice sort of, um, uh, I guess, maybe uh, interpretation or comparison that we could maybe apply to uh, the more sort of egalitarian nature of Bhutanese society, at least as it was, as it was recorded ethnographically. Um, in terms of dating these systems, uh, sorry, I went over these, um, clearing them. Actually, that was a unique part about actually doing this work is that we clear these sites they were, um, then people used them again. So we did the hard work. Well, I didn't do the hard work. I did a little bit, but um, yeah, some of the local boys uh, really stuck in and, and made this possible, got stuck in. Um, but yeah, um, dating these sites, I excavated two test units at Mahapua, which is right in the smack bay in the center of this really sort of built up area of garden terraces uh, on top of these terraces here. Um, I mean, the whole system looks like this. It's, that's no exaggeration. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, that excavating these two test units, uh, what was cool is that you'd come across um, older uh, or multi-generational ropi construction, uh, garden construction, and sorry, uh, these are called verenga, verenga, not ropi in this particular, these are water taro gardens called verenga. Um, and that within, um, as you're excavating, you come, um, 
across all the gardens. So yeah, multi-generational, multi-iterations, um, which was cool. Um, in terms of any sort of artifacts, you don't find anything and really can be super challenging just to find um, stuff to date. So you know, I excavated a number of these and didn't come out with anything. So it's time consuming. And in the end, you kind of think, oh, I wish I just had a shovel and which we did, but I mean, you just hoe in and try and dig up as much as you can, but you know, uh, lessons learned. Um, so, but at least at this place, we managed to get some um, charcoal that could date from underneath uh, the structure. And that came back at 1000 years BP. So again, uh, sitting within that, um, that same uh, chronology and that boundary. Oops, okay, I'm about going over a bit. Uh, this was just the next door, your kind of eye, uh, excavation. Uh, this was quite modern, 250 years, uh, but it's further down the hill. Maybe that's something um, that uh, you, uh, Taro uh, or terrace construction started uphill at the, at the start of the, uh, at the source of the water and, and progressed down. Anyway, um, this gives you an indication. Actually, Matthew Spriggs in this photo right pointed this out to me, is that the uh, running uh, up and uh, along the sides of these uh, irrigated systems, uh, drainage canals, of course. So these are really important for when you have torrential downfalls, cyclones, and that uh, there's not too much water going through the system, destroying the walls. Uh, and so these uh, purposely built um, drainage canals, stone line drainage canals, uh, um, funnel off any um, uh, excess, excess water. These are just some photos of uh, the mixed cropping, uh, mainly kava, taro, uh, and also um, how people move water from one place to another. This is actually done by Jimmy uh, with uh, some bamboo piping. So if you want water to go to a different garden, you can set up something cool like this. Okay, I need to wrap up. Um, so for tuna artifacts, like I just wanted to go over quickly, uh, these made me just show, you know, show local regional connections, um, which I think is, is good. It's a great story. You know, even though I wasn't finding the Polynesian uh, ads, um, you know, we're showing uh, regional connections, uh, which uh, is an important part of this story, uh, particularly when there's, um, uh, when the lingu linguistic and the oral histories uh, don't really match up. So, um, also, the ads form is, uh, these are all sort of um, collected by uh, Ming Asao and he allowed us to photograph them and I measured them and blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, basically they all uh, fall within the sort of Melanesian type ads form or what, are, what have lenticular cross sections. And these, again, this doesn't really vary for the last couple of thousand years. If I'm wrong, please uh, someone let me know. Um, but in this part of Melanesia, they don't really um, vary over um, quite an um, impressive amount of time. Um, what else was I going to say about them? Uh, Michelle Richards, uh, who's actually on here, I think she did a preliminary study of two adzers that we were um, gifted and are returning, sorry, to um, Tuna. Um, but they seem to also be um, locally, uh, local productions, at least to Tafe province, somewhere around Eremongo. So thank you, Michelle, for that work. Um, uh, shell artifact forms, uh, these are also um, date towards the most recent sort of uh, horizon, cultural horizon. Um, uh, Turkey water are these top lambus, uh, sort of gouge shells in the top right. Uh, we have conus gouging shells, um, uh, adzes, and then the tariba, tariba adds down in the bottom right. And these are also associated with later introductions to Melanesia. And I think in uh, the Iron Melanesians, Matthew Strick said uh, that they are possibly introduced from somewhere around Micronesia and aren't found in Polynesia. Um, so there, was an, there is a case to be made that also Polynesian outliers were the source of the introduction of many of these new artifact or normal artifact types to this, um, um, uh, to this uh, into Melanesia, into this region, if that makes sense, what I'm trying to say. Um, some of these tridacan ads are beautiful. Um, down on the bottom right, there's a fully polished um, sort of lenticular um, shaped tridacan. Uh, just quickly, uh, there was the, uh, yeah, an assemblage of artifacts. Um, the bottom right are killing stones or throwing stones, which are known um, from southern Vanuatu. Um, the top one is made from uh, volcanic stone. Uh, these are su supposedly like artisan um, commodities, precious commodities. Uh, from what I could, what I uh, accounts that I read in the ethnography, uh, that these were um, uh, made uh, middle bush, uh, so inland of Tanna, and that then they were traded with coastal groups, and then they were pro obviously probably traded with people for tuna. Uh, the coral form further down. These are hefty, um, really sort of serious weapons. Uh, they're quite brittle. So when you throw them, if you hit someone, they break. This is how it's described to me. And then when they're thrown back to you, they're not as dangerous. Um, so that's important that they break. 
um, but they are more common. And they're also recorded by Cook, uh, recorded by all missionaries, and these kawas, throwing stones, the volcanic ones. There was a couple of missionaries in South Panama who were nearly hit by them, I think, a few times. Um, so I think they're also interesting and, and, and um, worthwhile. Perhaps at least the kawas would, would be worthwhile maybe doing a bit more of a study on to, to look at where they fit in in that regional uh, network of southern Vanuatu. Uh, just a grinding, axe grinding stone in the top right. And the interesting part about this point, about the axe grinding stone, is that the name for them in Fortuna, which is uh, Fawanga, uh, is also the same as the name for Naife, uh, Naife language of South Tana, which is Fawanga. And it's also pretty much the same name for an item, which is no, no uh, I'm not sure about the pronunciation, folks, but um, uh, as Matthew said that um, the, the uniting word might have been introduced by um, Samoan teachers or missionaries, but um, you know, at least you, it would suggest that uh, if it is, I'm sure the United Meters were already familiar with the word um, for uh, axe grinding stones um, because of their uh, interactions with Fortuna. All right, uh, let's keep going. All right, so summary. So, We'll just go over this really quickly. Fortuna was settled by a population who, as part of their domestic kit, made earthenware pots sometime around 2,500 years BP. Uh, so this agrees with the archaeological record from neighbouring islands and demonstrates regional continuity between Fortuna and neighbouring islands. Uh, and then yeah, it seems that agricultural intensification on the island and investment in the construction of ropai uh, began sometime after 1000 AD. By 1000 AD, people were settling inland, so they'd moved from coastal camps. Uh, and we're starting to get village construction between this 1000 to 1500 AD. Um, so, and this is when I think sort of the ancestral uh, village and culture of what became known as the ethnographic present, present Futanese society, uh, including the um, development of the political spaces like Marai was, um, was established. Uh, and then although Fortuna had all the environmental traits associated with what uh, with increasing centralised political authority that you get on an ITIN, you know, East Fortuna, um, all over the Pacific, um, particularly Eastern Polynesia, uh, it seems that um, at least it, this doesn't seem to have, uh, have occurred, occurred in Fortuna. And perhaps this is because of their close relationship with Tana. Uh, and then finally, uh, archaeological evidence for Polynesian settlement remains elusive, but evidence for Fortuna's position in local regional networks that extended from Loyalty Islands, New Caledonia, uh, shown through ads form and also through greenstone pendants, which is the latter is another chapter which I did not talk about. And there's some opportunity for further research there. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh, there we go. All right, thank you, Rob. Fantastic, great stuff. Um, thank you. Sounds like you have. Uh, a lot of data to write now. <laughs> now it's a tough bit. The fun bit's over. What well, was? It? <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Um, any questions from uh, anybody in the crowd? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, Matthew Spriggs here. Um, I wondered if uh, if Rob has looked at. Um, some of Roger Green's settlement pattern work on uh, in Green and Davidson on Samoa, because my memory is that they have all those kind of raised walkways, and it would be interesting to compare the um, village layouts with the extensive maps that Green and Davidson produced in Samoa. Um, so that is on my list, Matthew, of research to look at. Uh, I think my issue was actually finding access to it. But yeah, definitely, it isn't something that I've looked at um, directly yet, but that was a comparison that I wanted to draw between Tatonga, that, uh, that, yeah, the, the village that you mentioned, and, and also a uh, village layout of Western Polynesia. So yeah, thank you. That is something that I, I do intend to pursue. But I mean, if, do, if you have any thoughts on it, I, I'm more than happy to drop them down. Uh, there is one raised hand, U3446883, uh, you can ask a question, thanks. Hi Rob, it's Dave here, how are you? Thank you very much for a great um, uh, presentation. Um, Rob, as you're aware, back here in Australia, I'm just looking at a comparison, we um, expect and now require quite strong levels of approvals, consultations with our community groups. How, what was the process over there for to carrying out um, getting approvals uh, and consultations with the traditional owner groups there, and um, um, and what benefits do you see your work um, having 
uh, with uh, and your ongoing works um, uh, being uh, to the community there? Thank you for your question, Dave. It's a tough one. <laughs> now, uh, I, well, how'd you ever ask me something on ethics? Um, no, but like, um, I mean, a, a lot of that initial work was done by James Stewart and um, Frederick uh, during their initial consultation and work with uh, in 2016. So, uh, I mean, one of the great things about Vanuatu is, um, and there's others that can speak to this a lot better than I can, uh, is that they have a long um, history of working, well, there's a, there's a long history of, of archaeologists and of uh, local Mi Vanuatu people working as archaeologists, as cultural heritage officers, as part of a large network that all spans out from the Vanuatu Cultural Centre. So uh, that sort of established uh, relationship um, really helps with sort of our um, introductions and our and sort of navigating that that kind of the politics of, of um, working yeah, yeah. In, in communities. Uh, so, um, I mean, on Fortuna, a lot of that came down to the work of Jimmy. And, uh, you know, as I said, he sort of really guided my research and, and, and really sort of um, laid the foundations in doing those introductions and, and, and making sure that people were okay with, with this work. Yeah. But it, there were occasions where they weren't okay with the work. Um, we didn't speak to the right people. Um, yeah. And we got back from, we got knocked back from working at a couple of sites. Um, and so that was just, you know, I guess it was a lesson you know, that, yeah. Um, yeah. that that I learned. And um, I mean, there was one particular site that towards the end that Jimmy, who actually descends directly from uh, the person who was the, uh, who the site is associated with, um, Koitiyama, who was one of the chiefs, uh, initial chiefs who was on the island when um, Reverend John Williams arrived. Um, and um, me and Jimmy had this great idea to go excavate at the site. The call came from Afate, not from in, not on island, from Port Villa, basically to say, no, you don't have permission to work there. So anyway, it's you know it's complex and um, and um, you know you just kind of navigate it as as it sort of pops up. Um, but yeah, thanks to J to Jimmy for really helping those things. Uh, in terms of ongoing uh, outcomes, I think you know. Yeah, I mean, how will that work benefit the community, Robert? Yeah, yeah. Like no, it's a good it's a good question. You know. I, I think that's the challenge as, as, as archaeologists, you know, like yeah. I find this as, as, as an Aboriginal archaeologist and that I'm sort of like, you know, what the heck is this doing for, for us? You know, what is this doing for my people? What is, you know, and, and that kind of thing. But I don't know. But I think once people get involved and they sort of learn what you're doing and, and as long as it doesn't really sort of, um, you know, contradict or go against any of their kind of beliefs that they already hold about their own history on island, um, so a lot of people in Fortuna think they, you know, they, they originate, like Aboriginal people do, like that we originate from on island. We don't come from anywhere else. You know? Yeah. I remember one more. What um, I'm hearing, Rob, is also this trust of, you know, the four archaeologists, Matthew, James and others that um, is there. And the fact that Ralph, I went to uni with Ralph a few yeah. years, decades ago, and now is the, well, future prime minister, but also the was the Minister for Heritage and Culture and the head of, of the museum. So, no, thank you, Rob. I appreciate that. Yeah. And a wonderful talk, brother. Very proud yeah. of you. Thanks, Dave. Like, I'm really just a, a novice in this field. Um, there's a lot of people who've sort of come before me and, and laid the foundation. So, you know, it's off the, it's off the work they've done that I get this opportunity. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, anybody else, um, feel free to use the chat uh, if you don't want to talk. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Rob, I don't know if you had a chance to look at the chat. There's a few thank yous and Simon, Simon Connor is asking if you need volunteers for uh, field work. Volunteers? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not going back anytime soon. <laughs> uh, yeah, for him to uh, definitely get in contact with uh, Stuart and Matthew to see what sort of projects they have going on. If that's the case. I'm not sure if James is going back either anytime soon. Yeah. Potentially, not his head. Yeah. I can't bring up the, um, I can't seem to find the, the chat. Oh, there we go. So there's Michelle with her hand raised, and then Philip just posted a question on the chat. Hey, Rob. Um, I was just wondering the edges are quite small um, that you looked at and that you've recovered. Did you find anything that um, might suggest what they were used for or contextually, what do you thought they were used for within those sites? And then of course, there's all the collections in the um, cultural center that I've looked at that we can work on in the future when you finish your PhD, we can do some comparisons there as well. Um, 
so, sorry, the cultural center in Vanuatu? Or? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so are you talking about really the sort of, well, I'm sorry, that picture might just be a bit misleading. Um, some of those stone adzes are quite large. Um, uh, so I'm going to bring some up. Yeah, it's probably easier. But anyway, um, so I'm, I guess ethnography is the thing to base what they were used on. Um, and I guess we're mainly for clearing gardens, agriculture, uh, woodworking, perhaps. But then some of the other forms, these little gouges uh, and mm -hmm. those sort of things, like you know, more specifically for things like uh, canoe construct, like um, construction. Well, I'm, I'm not really an expert in this. So. I might just be making it up as I go, but as Ningasau, one of the local followers described it to me, is that the Tokiwaro, which is that lamber shell adds, uh, the one that's sort of built like a, shaped like a gouge, would be uh, attached to a large shaft, and that would be used in this sort of action of sort of uh, prodding, I guess, I don't know, um, basically to carve out or do any sort of woodworking, particularly associated with canoes. Uh, the stone adds, is I'm not, I'm not quite familiar with, I imagine they were just made for agricultural landscape. Does that answer your question, sorry? Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering if you found them in any context that oh, no, no, any no, hints no. or... Yeah, no, sorry. They were all just surface finds. Um, and they were all basically collected by Ning as how. Um, yeah, look, it would have been great to find an ads up in one of the garden terraces, but yeah, it just didn't happen. Maybe <laughs> next time. Ralph, would you mind having a look at Philip's question on the chat? It's a bit long. I'll read it yeah. out loud. Okay, sorry, I just grabbed that. Philip. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, look, I haven't, um, no, that's a really good, uh, a good point. I'm not really quite sure what to sort of what to add. Yeah, um, I mean, the actual Mariah structures, uh, interestingly, uh, sort of they're not like. Uh, sorry, James has talked about this multiple times, but they're not really like the Mariah that you get in Eastern Polynesia, uh, where you have sort of more sort of elaborate or in, uh, stone um, uh, infrastructure surrounding Mariah or whatever. So, um, you know. Uh, interestingly, they match more with the Imwarin or the Nakamal is the Bislama word for uh, the Tanese Nakamal, so sort of more open spaces. I mean, this might be an indication about sort of the level of hierarchy and centralised power and that the Futanese ones really sort of just match up more with the Tanese system um, and that uh, this, yeah, that is definitely um, something that I will that I'll explore a bit more and it definitely there is a relationship there between um, the Tana Imwarin uh, Nakamals uh, and also the Futanese in terms of the actual space, the, the way this, the, the outlay. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something that we'll, I'll talk about more in my thesis and, and explore. Thanks, Philip. That's a good, good, good point. We have uh, Emily and James on the chat also uh, after, but yeah, Emily, go first. Thanks. Um, hi, Rob. Thank you. It was really, really interesting um, and beautiful sites as well. Really nice. Um, you just talk about um, some of your artifacts showing evidence, possible evidence um, of um, networks, especially with New Caledonia. Um, and so sorry if I missed that, but did you have any oral traditions um, directly related to exchange with New Caledonia uh, from the communities that you work with? Yeah, um, so for New Caledonia, um, I'm not, I'm not familiar with any that are directly linked with Fortuna. I know that Anaitu obviously has um, quite a strong connection with uh, the loyalties. Um, and I imagine that then uh, spread uh, further north to Fortuna because it's just all part of the interaction sphere. Um, but yeah, I, I, there's no specific uh, uh, narratives or stories on island which relate specifically to uh, the loyalty islands. I mean, there may be, um, but um, I'm not aware of any. Um, most of the stories about um, connections with other parts and other regions, they, they all uh, use the word, they all are associated with Tonga. And whether this is Tonga uh, actually is in the, you know, the Tongan kingdom archipelago at that time um, is, might not be, um, uh, accurate because the, the word for foreigner in Futanese is Tamatonga. So everyone was calling me a Tamatonga, which you know, if you sort of interpret that, it literally means a, a man from Tonga. 
Anyway, that's a bit confusing with what I'm trying to explain. But yeah, nothing that seems to sort of pop out from New, New Caledonia. Um, but then I didn't really talk about it and I haven't really studied about it, but you get the greenstone pendants, which were uh, you know, a you know, precious commodity. I uh, traded um, from New Caledonia or through to Nitium, uh, to Futuna and to Tana, um, which um, James and others have done some work on. But anyway, that's, that's something, that's also a, a chapter that needs some more sort of research done. Okay, thank you. It's all right. Is there more? Um... No, okay, I think we can probably wrap this up. Uh, Rob, yeah. well, thank you so much here for the presentation. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, yeah, uh, big, uh, yeah. Uh, um, I was about to think, I was trying to remember when the next email will be, and I can't remember it. So. I, Stay in touch to the car uh, mailing list for the next ones. But yeah, um, Rob, yeah, looking forward to catch up uh, whenever the lockdown ends and uh, we're able to travel around. Um, thank you very much and uh, see you soon. Awesome. Thanks, Matthew. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>